وبركاته حضورنا الكريم مرحبا بكم في فعاليات اليوم الثاني من قمة المعرفة 2018 التي تنظمها مؤسسة محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم للمعرفة تحت عنوان الشباب ومستقبل اقتصاد المعرفة ونواصل جلساتنا الثرية التي تغطي جميع محاور عنوان القمة وبالتحديد جلستنا الأولى لهذا الصباح والتي سنستضيف فيها عيسى الشامسي نائب الرئيس التنفيذي في شركة الياه سات وعامر الصايغ الغافري مدير مشروع خليفة سات في مركز محمد بن راشد للفضاء ومشاعل الشميمري أول سعودية متخصصة في الصواريخ الفضائية ونيكول ستوت رائدة فضاء من ناسا يحاورهم سعود عبد العزيز كرمسجي مدير إدارة العمليات لبرنامج رواد الفضاء بمركز محمد بن راشد للفضاء في جلسة تحت عنوان توطين المعرفة لاستيطان الفضاء فليتفضلوا للمنصة مشكورين Please welcome our moderator and speakers to this stage so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth annual Knowledge Summit. Uh, I believe it was an exciting day. Uh, today is the second day. We're looking forward to more sessions to conduct. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for attending the exciting session with the title of Knowledge Localization for Space and Habitation. Uh, as you're informed, my name is Saud Karmasaji head of the operation management for the UAE astronaut program at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. Uh, honestly, it's an honor to moderate this session with such uh, great uh, key players from the space industry. Uh, and uh, please note that this session, again, as I mentioned, it will be in English. However, there's a translation. So if anyone wants it in Arabic, there's, uh, the team are back there. They can provide you with headphones so you can enjoy this session as well. Uh, so. Today's session topics will include a few main ones, four main pillars. One is UAE into space, propelled by young Emirati national minds. Second is how the space industry contributed to the development of the other industries. Uh, third will be the importance of the knowledge sharing in the space industry. And fourth will be the global economic growth for the space sector. Uh, luckily, we have this uh, the great speakers here with us today. And uh, I will give you guys a quick brief about each one of them before they start and they talk about uh, themselves and they present about themselves. So here at the beginning, we have uh, astronaut uh, Nicole Stott, a retired astronaut from NASA, uh, from NASA. Her experience includes two space flights. So she's been to the space uh, twice for over three months. Uh, sh uh, through Space Shuttle, and she went to the International Space Station as well. And honestly, this is very unique, because these two achievements happened at two different milestones. So to have an astronaut here with us, who has been through both of them, is honestly a pleasure to be here with you on the same panel. Uh, she was actually the first person to fly the robotic arm to capture the free-flying HTV cargo vehicle. Uh, she was the last crew member fl uh, to fly to and from their ISS, through the space shuttle. And uh, she was a member of the crew of the final flight of the space shuttle discovery. Uh, and there are more in into it, so I don't want to tell you guys all the details. Uh, but she's been quite busy until today. I don't think you ever sleep, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going next, uh, here we have Mashaal uh, Shememri. Basically, Mashaal, I think most of you guys know her. She's very popular uh, on our social media platforms especially in the Arab region. Uh, Mishal is a Saudi-American uh, Saudi American aerospace engineer, at the same time an aerospace entrepreneur, a speaker, and influencer. And uh, just to let you guys know, she was born in the US, and she spent a few years of her early life uh, back in Saudi Arabia. And uh, she's fascinated about space. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Uh, currently, she's pursuing her passion by educating and inspiring the next generations. She already started her company, Mishal Aerospace, and she has her own rockets. Yes. So I'll make sure I will never make you upset in my life, OK? So and next, we have uh, Amr Asayig Al Ghafri. So Amr Asayig Al Ghafri brought a big, let's say, happiness to us uh, in the UAE. Amr Asayig is uh, the project manager of Khalifa Saad. 
Khalifa Saad is basically the first uh, Arab satellite that was fully developed in the United Arab Emirates by Emirati people, 100%. So this was an achievement for us this year, and it was a big celebration uh, for all of us. Even the older generation, even my mom and dad who are not very familiar with the space, they were very excited and they were con congratulating me as well. I don't know why, but uh, they did that. So, so Amr been at the Space Center since the beginning, since the f uh, the, it was established in the year of 2006. So he has worked uh, heavily on Dubai Sat 1, Dubai Sat 2, and Khalifa Sat, and many other projects. Uh, he's leading the team working on the innovation and adv advancement of the UAE space technology. And he has been awarded as the UAE's Pride Medal in 2014 for his accomplishment. Uh, last but not, but not least, we have Isa Butli Shamsi. Uh, Isa is uh, the ex Executive Vice President for Technology and System Engineering in Yasat. Uh, Isa uh, is responsible of designing, implementing, and delivering satellite based solutions to end users. Uh, during his eight year journey at the Yasat, uh, Isa held uh, various technical and executive positions in satellite operation, ground segment, and payload operation engineering. Uh, prior to, in, to joining Yasat, uh, he, was, he served in the UAE Armed Forces. So before we start, and um, before they talk about themselves, can we give them please a round of applause? <laughs> so basically now we'll start a quick brief uh, for each person with a presentation in the background. We'll start with the astronaut uh, Stott. The floor is yours. Ah, I think uh, we were gonna go the other way, but. So thank you very much for the, the very kind welcome. Um, I'm, I honestly feel blessed to have had the opportunity to fly in space, to spend three months living and working on the space station with um, the most remarkable international community um, that, uh, that we have, I think, both on and off the planet, and that just continues to grow. And I see that around me here today. Um, with the activities that are going on. Looking forward to uh, an astronaut flying in space soon, I think. Hopefully. And so look forward to that. I'm um, gonna share with you, I, you know, I flew in space, but I think uh, flying in space, what it does is it brings you back to Earth. And so I'd like to just uh, share with you, even though uh, we do very complex things in space. Um, you know, the robotic operations that you mentioned, the science that's going on. Uh, I think my time in space really brought me back to Earth and it taught me three simple lessons that I'd like to share with you today. That, you know, we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. And those I know seem like very simple lessons, like what we learned when we're very young, but I don't think we consider them all the time. And I think that we should. Um, this picture that I'm showing you right now, it's a silhouette of the space shuttle Atlantis. Uh, it is one picture that reminds me of what it was like to live and work in space. Um, it's very beautiful. Uh, to be in space is very beautiful. The view out the window is stunning. And even though it looks very still, it reminds me, I know, I know that we were traveling at 17,500 miles an hour or five miles a second or around the earth every 90 minutes, which means that every 45 minutes we get one of these sunrises or sunsets out the window. Uh, I also know that inside of that little silhouetted Atlantis is, uh, I am there with my five crewmates and we're on our way home after our mission in space. And I know also that the person who took this picture, Jeff Williams, uh, who I spent several months with on the space station, is still on that station and took this picture for us to have this memory. But it also reminds me that I was separated from the planet like I probably will never be again. And at that same time, though, I felt really more connected to everything that goes on here on Earth than I do or did while I was um, uh, here and all in between it. During the time that I lived in space, I spent most of my time on this uh, International Space Station. Absolute masterpiece in space, built by uh, 16 different countries. Uh, the cooperation that goes on both on the Earth and in space is uh, really impressive. Uh, this is, if you think about it, the most off-the-grid 
um, place to live that you can imagine. All of our electrical power is generated through those large solar arrays. We live in the little modules that look like kind of like the cans, can float around in our normal clothing. Um, but this one place in space is absolutely the best model, I think, for how we should be operating as Earthlings down here on Spaceship Earth. And of course, you know, we built this life support system in space, the space station, and we do that because we have people living and working in space. Uh, these are the crewmates that I spent my time with on the space station, and um, absolutely the best mix of personality and of professionalism. We had a good time when we were in space. Um, the clown noses are really uh, the gentleman that's front row, second in. His name is Guy Laliberté, and he. Uh, was able to pay his way to space and spent 10 days there with us. Um, but this, these are the kind of people you want to work with down here and in space because you know you're going to enjoy your time, but you also know that when it doesn't go right and it's not always going to go right, you will have each other's backs and, and make sure that um, you are successful. So when I first got to space, I did not think much about those three simple rules, or those three simple lessons, actually, of, you know, we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings, and the thin blue line. Um, I wanted to see what was familiar to me first. Um, I grew up in Florida, so I wanted to see Florida from space. It is absolutely stunning from space. I can tell you that looking out that window, there is no denying the absolute interconnectivity between everything and everyone that is down there. And I thought about Florida as my home when I first got to space. But what happened is I started thinking about home as planet Earth. And Florida became like this special place on that planet. And this picture shows Florida still, but I hope you'll agree, quite beautiful and a part of, uh, part of the planet. This should look familiar. I think that you know we, we look for places that are surprising to us. And every time you would look out the window on the space, from the space shuttle or station, you are surprised. You know, we, we're asked a lot, can you see that Great Wall of China? Well, you can't see the Great Wall of China with your naked eye, but you can see the Palm Island with your naked eye, and you can get some really wonderful pictures. But even when we're looking at places like this, we need to be considering our place on the planet. And uh, when we go to space, even when we go on robotic missions where we're not sending humans, we're always looking for that connection back to ourselves. In this picture of Saturn from the Cassini mission, that tiny little dot of light is Earth. And we always want that picture. It's the one that is most awesome to us. Even new missions, uh, like the uh, SpaceX missions, the Falcon missions, one of the big rockets that they sent up recently, they actually sent a red Tesla Sportster with uh, the Starman in the front seat. And while that is really cool, very heavy metal, if any of you are old enough to know the heavy metal reference, um, I think the most stunning thing is the view of our planet, this new kind of view of our planet in the background. For me, I spent that time in space. Um, I'm working now, I retired from NASA about three years ago, and I'm working to connect the two things that I love the most, uh, space exploration and art. I want to share with as many people as I possibly can that space flight experience, and I'm also engaging with kids like Michelle is with um, sharing that love um, with them and also encouraging them to, to find their inspiration and path forward. I had the opportunity to paint in space um, with some watercolors. Um, that was fun, but we could spend all day talking about that, so I won't. I know we're <laughs> on a time here. And I just want to wrap up with this one image, probably the most iconic image about who and where we all are, and this reminder of we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings, and the thin blue line. I think that as we talk here today, we're talking about new innovations. We're talking about how to engage youth and, um, and how to use the knowledge not just the information and the data that we collect, but how to use that as knowledge. And these three lessons to me are the things we should be thinking about in any way forward, whether it's in space or down here on Earth. And I think that what we're gonna hear today is, is really and truly all about that and how we move forward for our collective future here on planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Uh, now we go to Mshaad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
I'm going to start by uh, explaining to you what inspired me to get into the aerospace industry. Uh, it actually started when I was six years old. My mom took me to the desert, and, or as we call here, uh, Nafud Neza, uh, so, which is uh, the deserts in Saudi Arabia. She took me there in, at night. And when I looked up in the sky, I saw a high density of stars. And I was mesmerized from that moment. And I kept asking questions, asking my mom, my sister, my cousins, everyone, like, oh, why are those stars up there? What are they made out of? Why is this one flickering more than the other? Why is this one brighter than this one? Why is this one flickering red and this one is not? So I had so many questions. And that was my inspiration. So from that moment and that age at six, I decided the only way for me to figure out what's in space is to go to space. And in order to do that, you have to make rockets. So therefore, I have to be somebody that makes rockets. So I decided, well, guess what? I'm going to be an aerospace engineer. And so obviously, in order to become an aerospace engineer, you have to have like a scientific uh, inclination. Uh, when I was in high school, I did robotics. I did first robotics competition twice, and I did uh, battle bots. Uh, in first robotics competition, we won first in our, re in our um, region and third on the nation. So we it was pretty cool. And then I went to college. I studied aerospace engineering. And ma because you take so much math in aerospace, I figured, you know what, I'll take uh, another degree in math. So then I did two majors. Then I did my master's in aerospace engineering, and the focus of my master's, uh, which was funded by NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, was to design a nuclear thermal rocket for Mars missions. So these are the types of rockets you would use to go to Mars and take humans uh, to Mars. Then, um, after that, I worked for Raytheon. It's a big uh, defense contractor in the US for a couple of years. And then I decided at 26 years old to start my own rocket company which was kind of crazy. But just to give you a little background, so in the GCC, I'm the first uh, aerospace engineer. I have a large presence in social media, mainly to entice young people, uh, women and men, to join STEM, uh, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, the idea is to expose them to aerospace, expose them to the science behind space and so forth. So I discuss so many different topics to try to get them to be interested and hopefully they become the aerospace engineers of the future. Um, aside from being a, a speaker and aerospace person and a person that made rockets, I also do uh, consult in aerospace and then I have other businesses that are super unrelated to aerospace. Uh, you've got to diversify your portfolio, what can you do? So after working for Raytheon, I loved working there because it was very high paced. So I was there, I worked on 22 different rockets. It was really exciting. Uh, because it's the engineering aspect, you're designing and you're uh, creating models and predictive analysis and that sort of thing. But then in 2010, when I left Raytheon, uh, the market wasn't that great for aerospace. A lot of the companies like Boeing, Lockheed and so forth, everyone was laying off people. So it was not the best opportunity to find another job. So I was like, well, I have two options. Either I sit here and mope or I create my own opportunity. So I decided to create my own opportunity by starting my company at age 26 to make rockets. Because my goal in life is to explore space, to uh, advance technology to go to space, to explore other planets. So in order to do that, I need to make rockets. A lot of people were like, you're crazy. You're only 26. You don't know what you're doing. And I was like, you know what? It's better to try and fail than not to try at all. So I'm going to try and see how it goes. So then I decided uh, uh, to make these rockets, and my target market is small satellites. And this video, if you can play it, it gives you an idea as to why I started this business. Can we have sound? My name is Michelle Ashimembri. My background is in aerospace engineering. I got my degree from Florida Institute of Technology, and my specialty is in rocket design. I've always known that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer since I was six years old when I was gazing at the stars and wondering what they were. If I wanted to understand them, I need to go into space. And in order for me to go into space, I need to develop the rockets that take me there. The mission of Michelle Aerospace is to develop low-cost rockets for space access, including uh, orbital and lunar missions. Our vision is to allow smaller satellites to have access to space and allow the general public to have a cost-effective means to go into space. 
the technology has been advanced and technology is becoming miniaturized. So there's a lot more satellites that are getting smaller and smaller, but yet have no way of accessing space. A lot of the rockets that exist today are targeted for larger satellites and larger payloads. So there's a huge gap in that market. And that's how we decided to try to cater to that market because they, they're growing. And the main problem that they're having is they don't have a cost-effective way of access to space. We have two locations. The headquarters is in Miami, Florida, which is where we do the design simulation. And we have the Arizona office, which contains the uh, integration, testing, and putting hardware together. So Michelle Aerospace is developing the following rocket line. It's called the M rocket. Uh, our first rocket is the MSV, which is this one. It's a hybrid rocket booster and uh, it's intended for a microgravity environment, meaning it just goes into space and then comes back down. This MSV, which uses the hybrid rocket, is used as a booster in the MOV. So this is the MOV, which is the orbital vehicle. Its intention is to put a satellite into orbit. We have the last line here is the MLV, which is the lunar vehicle. A successor of this would be the MHLV, which is the heavy lifting vehicle that rocket will be able to go to the moon and bring back samples to Earth. So in addition to our uh, M rocket line, uh, we also provide the uh, launch service. We have our own launch facility, we launch our own rockets. What we're doing in Michelle Aerospace is game changing. We're providing an underserved market with access to space. In addition, we will be the first company to access the moon. By doing so, we will allow the scientific community to have access to lunar resources that will improve mankind in developing more research in fusion engines and using alternative sources that are available to the moon. From this research, we will be able to solve energy problems as well as other things that are unknown to us today. My name is Ms. Okay, I'll skip my name, obviously, you know. So the idea is to develop these rockets. As you can see, the SV is a suborbital vehicle which feeds into the development of the OV, which is what puts a satellite into orbit. And then the LV, which is the lunar vehicle, that purpose of that is obviously to go to the moon. And uh, people ask me a lot, how do you make money? So a lot of people think, okay, you make the rockets and you sell them. You don't sell the rockets. Uh, you make the rockets and you sell the service of launching the satellites into space. So how do you make money? You take a satellite, you put it into the rocket, and I take you into space. So let's say you guys have a satellite. You come to me, you're like, hey, I'm Shad, can you please take this to space? I put it in, launch it, and then you pay me for the fact that I actually took you there and put you where you need to go. So that's how we uh, make money. In terms of the capacity, to give you an idea, we take payloads that are one kilo all the way up to 500 kilograms. Um, 500 kilograms is about the weight of a grizzly bear. Not the volume of a grizzly bear, but the weight of a grizzly bear. So you kind of get an idea of how heavy that is. Um, it's, and small satellites is a category of satellites that are 500 kilograms or less. And we take, you know, like I said, one all the way to 500. And that's basically it about me. Thank you. Thank you, Mishael, for such an impressive presentation. We're proud of your achievement and activities, to be honest. I could see even my dad, by the way, watches your videos. I don't know if he gets anything, but he actually watches it. And he was telling me, like, actually two weeks ago, look at this lady from Saudi Arabia, she builds rockets. And I'm like, I'm like I didn't even get it. Why is he watching such video? But uh, thank you for the message and the activities that you're doing, especially for the Arabic audi audience and for the region. Uh, and a quick thing, I think from now on, let's say STEAM, because STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. If we keep saying STEM, we'll make uh, astronaut Nicole upset. She likes to say STEAM, so we have to add the A for art. Okay, so next uh, we'll go to Amr Sayyid. So I think Amr will be covering for us not only Khalifa Sat, I think about the Space Center. The whole Space the whole. Center, yes. Okay, sure. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'll be talking about this. Uh, in this presentation about the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center and what we did and we plan to do in the future. Um, yeah, so many videos in this uh, presentation, so that will make it, give me less time to talk. Now.
So we started in 2006, and that was the establishment of the Emirates Institution for Advanced Science and Technology. And back in 2015, uh, there was, let's call it a rebranding. Uh, but in reality, EST, the institution was uh, incubated in the Mohammed Barajid Space Center, a newly established entity. Uh, what's our vision? Our vision is to be recognized globally as a center of excellence in the field of space science. And our mission is to build sustainable science and technology by focusing on projects and programs and the people who are doing it and the facilities and the infrastructure that we uh, use to support it. This is MBRC team. I mean, we are very proud. We are 100% UAE nationals, and now we are around 175. And our average age in the center is 27. Very young center, and uh, with a big mix of male and female. We have around 40% of our employees are actually females, and most of them are actually in the technical and scientific uh, sections. Back in 2017, the center was uh, mandated by the UAE government to uh, execute the National Space Program. And the UAE National Space Program has four main pillars. The first one is satellites development locally in the UAE. And the second one is the HOPE probe, the Emirates Mars mission. And then the very long strategic uh, project and program called uh, Mars 2117, which is to have, after 100 years, a full colony established on Mars. And then the UAE astronaut program. I'll be speaking uh, briefly about each of these uh, main pillars. If we start with the satellite development program, this was the beginning. This is where we started in 2006. And the main focus was to build the capabilities in our people. So we have sent several uh, engineers. At the beginning, there were eight. And then the number increased to 22, 22. And then the number kept increasing, where we actually built capabilities in our own researchers and scientists. And these uh, researchers were involved in these two main uh, projects, Dubai Sat 1 and Dubai Sat 2. In this project, we carefully selected a partner from South Korea, which was um, very flexible with us and very open with us to share the knowledge. We started with no absolute knowledge on space or aerospace or any technology in space. And throughout these programs, throughout the work with our partners, we started gradually getting more involved and understanding the space technologies and how to make satellites. So we started with BISAT-1. Our involvement was around roughly 30%. It was more focused on us learning about a technology. And on the second one, uh, Dubai Sat 2, our engineers started to get involved. Some of the technologies uh, developed on Dubai Sat 2 were actually proposed and developed by our own engineers. And they are basically two Earth observation satellites. And uh, the, f the first one was launched in 2009, and the second was on 2013. And then, as uh, Saud mentioned, we started Khalifa Sat. This is where we actually said, we started working with our partners, but now we had the confidence, we have the capability to do things on our own. We did not start by Khalifa Sat, I mean, suddenly. We had to go gradually, and by 2013, with the announcement of Khalifa Sat, we started uh, doing things in the UAE. And there's a small, short video again about where we did it and how we did it.
It's already launched, huh? Okay, what is Khalifa Sat? Khalifa Sat is the third, third Earth observation satellite uh, for MBRC and for the UAE, actually. 100% uh, developed by Emiratis, uh, began in 2013, and it was launched by uh, our Japanese partner, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry. Uh, in these projects, we kept improving the uh, capabilities of these satellites. I mean, maybe most of you or some of you know about Earth observation satellites. They take images, and these images, depending on their quality, they can be giving, uh, giving us a lot of applications on the ground. And uh, yeah, another video about Khalifa Sat and the launch and the reception of the first signal. Monitoring solar panel voltage and FSS Z. I'm really proud. I'm really proud that I've worked on this project. Maybe what I did is less than the others. I think the others have done so much for this project. But I'm happy that we made it. Finally, we launched. Finally, received the first signal. We checked the health of the satellite. It's really good, looking good. I'm so happy to see the success of our Khalifa Sat team. We did a great job. I thank every member and Khalifa Sat team. And yes, uh, we do work on big satellites like Khalifa Sat, but we also focus on steam. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna speed up. Uh, this is uh, the first satellite, the first CubeSat for the UAE, Naif-1. It was launched in 2017. And it was fully developed by students at the AUS, American University of Sharjah. And uh, it was uh, initiated by uh, MBRSC. And uh, most of the students that were working on uh, Naif-1 are now actually members of MBRSC. Uh, DMSat, uh, we developed satellites. We proved our capabilities, and we started working with other government entities like Dubai municipalities in developing satellites for their own usage. And that's uh, DMSAT. Uh, it will be launched in 2020, and it will have focus on providing data on greenhouse gases, which is a typical application for uh, Dubai municipality. And then the Emirates Mars mission. We all know about this. This is the biggest mission uh, for space in the UAE. This is the first Arab Islamic uh, hope probe. I mean, it will be the first Arab Islamic uh, satellite to be reaching Mars. And that would be in uh, 2021. So the launch will be on 2020. And then it will arrive to Mars in uh, 2021, which is the 50th anniversary of uh, the UAE establishment. Uh, the team working on Khalifa Sa'at and all other projects are actually now continuing to work on this very challenging uh, mission. This probe will travel in space for about maybe 60 million kilometers to reach Mars. It's very challenging, and a few countries around the world managed to do that. So we hope that the UAE will be one of these few countries. The mission timeline, we started in 2015, and uh, as I mentioned, we are expecting the launch in 2020, July, June, July, and then uh, by early 2021, we hope to uh, reach Mars and orbit there. The, this mission is very unique because we do have other satellites, I mean, as humans, we do have other uh, satellites around Mars, but this mission will give us a uh, very thorough and uh, overview of what Mars' atmosphere is like. Uh, why we are studying Mars? Because Mars is, people look at it as either the history of the Earth or the future of Earth. So it's very important for the scientific community to understand what's happening on Mars to help us here on Earth the Mars 2117. This is a big program. Um, the idea is, as I, as I said, is to build a colony uh, on Mars 100 years from now. And to do that, we need uh, so many uh, things to do. And uh, we cannot do this alone. So we have four main pillars in this uh, program, is to do a lot of research and development to help us build this colony. And uh, for that, we have to improve the education level not only in the UAE, but even globally, uh, to support uh, this kind of uh, long-term uh, strategic goal. And we need enablers, and in these enablers, we have to have a lot of uh, work with 
industrial partners, economical partners, financial partners, legal things. All of this has to be made and set up to be able to achieve our goal. And then we cannot do this alone. A lot of initiatives around the world, in the US, in Europe, in Japan, and in, in Russia, and we have to actually work together to do this. And the biggest, or the first and biggest uh, project in, under the Mars 2117 program will be the Mars Science City, which is uh, a city that will be built in, uh, in Dubai. And it will be focused on research on Mars and how to re live on Mars. And uh, as, as I mentioned, the focus would be the education, uh, science of food, water, and energy. We have a lot of challenges on Earth on these. And definitely, uh, studying Mars, living on Mars, will help us on Earth. Uh, there will be different laboratories and, uh, of course, a museum to keep people interactively uh, uh, involved in this uh, mission. Uh, it's a huge mission, a few figures here. Uh, it's going to have uh, around 2 million square foot uh, for this city, uh, different uh, space labs, not for research from UAE people only, but also international researchers can actually come and do research in this city. And then the uh, flagship UAE astronaut uh, program. Um, this is to actually launch the first Emirati to the International Space Station. This will be the first Arab to go to the International Space Station. Uh, you know, this is, uh, the, the word astronaut is, is big enough for us to all to understand the challenge to do so. But for the UAE, it's not uh, a one-time thing. We'd like to have a sustainable astronaut program where we will send not only the first one, but multiple ones to support very long-term uh, strategic goals. And one of them would be this Mars 2117. So the program started in uh, 2017. We have reached, uh, sorry, I think end of 2016, uh, yeah, end of 2017, sorry. And uh, we've, we started looking for these astronauts. We received around 4,000 uh, applicants and we selected at the moment two. And then this will continue to grow as we select more and more uh, astronauts. But these two astronauts have been selected. Uh, I'm sure many of you know them, uh, Hazza al-Mansouri and uh, Sultan Niyadi. They are actually started now uh, their training to be an astronaut. And uh, hopefully by next year or uh, sometime soon, they will be actually on one of these space flights to the International Space Station. And uh, this is some videos about their training that they are taking now. Just a few words uh, concluding this, uh, specifically about the astronaut program. Uh, it's not easy to be an astronaut. Not everybody is fit or can be an astronaut. But this is not the end, because I'm sure Nicole also will, will, will agree with me. What the astronauts are doing is mostly research for the scientists and the people who are living on Earth. Most of their agendas is actually given for, from people who are actually doing a lot of studies and research on Earth. So. If you are not an astronaut, definitely you will be actually telling the astronaut 
what to do. So this is a very interesting fact that all of us should know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amr. Okay, I think now we'll go to Isa. So this is the last presentation, and then after that, we'll start the moderation session. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I think uh, enough about me. My name is Isa Shamsi. But we covered my profile, I mean, earlier. So I work for Yasat. Yasat is a fully owned company by Mubadala Investment. It was established in 2007. Uh, for a specific need uh, to provide secure communication for the armed forces and the government. And various other opportunities that was created during that establishment where uh, we thought of serving not only UAE, other countries with other kind of services based on satellites. So for example, uh, internet over satellites. If we look at different regions like Africa, Latin America, those regions doesn't have infrastructure. So they lack infrastructure and the communication is something very vital during those days. Providing internet over satellites for those regions, supporting the communities, supporting, for example, the health sector, the education sector there was one of the initiatives that we as at, we thought of trying to, to lead it. We have other services as well in our portfolio, uh, for example, uh, broadcasting, uh, communications, and even uh, not only dedicated for the military, we have kind of a, a commercial communication as well. With respect to the fleet that we have, we have currently uh, three satellites up and running, flying. We acquired Thraya recently, and they already have two satellites, so in total we have a fleet of five satellites currently. What I'm going to uh, try to tackle in this presentation is not who we are, because I think uh, everyone knows who's uh, Yasat and what kind of uh, services they provide. I want to tackle a specific initiatives that Yasat is taking currently with respect to the transfer of knowledge to, to the national. We'll tackle something which already been mentioned by uh, Amr, who is Amr here. Uh, they did something which is similar for uh, Naif 1. We in Yasat, we thought of uh, a, Q a CubeSat program. And we had a specific goals for that program. And we had various stakeholders in that specific program. But the main goals that we wanted to focus on, we wanted to evolve this program to become like a center of excellence, which is focused on a real hands-on. So people will have the opportunity of freely designing and building and testing CubeSat and launching them. We wanted to develop a domestic capacity within this specific sector. We wanted to attract the global expertise in order to enhance the knowledge transfer process. We wanted to educate a highly skilled students that we have here, which in turn, they will transition into this UAE space industry after that. The main stakeholders that we had, we had, uh, from the academia point of view, we had uh, Khalifa University with a specific mandate. So basically, uh, they will provide us with the uh, competent faculties and the suitable facilities to accommodate this uh, specific program. They were supposed to look after, shall I say, ensuring the quality or the implementation of this program <coughs> as per the specification that was defined. They will secure accreditation, which they already did for this specific program. So it's a master degree focused on space engineering. YASAT role, as part of being even uh, a stakeholder in this, is funding this program for the initial four years, assuring the quality of the implementations that is happening uh, during the program, and providing a support shall I say, leveraging on its own position with the satellite manufacturer in the industry. We had the third main stakeholder, Northrop uh, Grumman, which is a satellite vendor company. So their, their mandate was to assist on the establishment of this program, recommend any kind of changes on the course structure itself or the curriculum, plus launching the CubeSat. What we thought of 
this CubeSat, what's going to happen in the long run? An ecosystem will be kind of formed around this CubeSat. So various players will come into the equation, be it regulator like TRA, space agency, entrepreneur will have uh, the opportunities to, to, to step into this. Uh, we will open a wider opportunities for the other universities or the, the whole academia sector. We will have an involvement from various uh, satellite vendors, including MBRC as well, and the satellite industry. But the benefits that we will get from this ecosystem is basically we will support the national agenda of being the regional leader in the space industry. We will try to establish or we will be able to establish a UAE as a regional scientific R&D hub. We will be able to attract and encourage a disruptive small satellite startups within this region. We can enable through this ecosystem the adoptions of the IoT applications where everything is now is moving towards the IoT. So in order to accommodate this CubeSat programs, we had to build a specific lab or provide a specific kind of facilities to support all of this. And this specific lab, it's, uh, it's came actually, or it's a response to, to the UAE leaderships, which is calling for a development uh, of uh, the, space, the space sectors in UAE, a plus to make a continuing kind of stride towards the UAE missions of being uh, the space, the space uh, lead in that region. So this lab, it was designed in a way to provide students and faculties in Masdar Institute and Khalifa University with a specific facilities. It's a state-of-the-art facilities that will allow them to be uh, to to design and uh, construct, integrate small satellites, and they will be able through that program to launch it and run the operation on those, run a specific scientific uh, application on that. I could say this is a great collaboration, I mean the, the lab between, if you, if you try to see it, between the academia sector and the space sector in UAE. Because with this, with this specific uh, lab, what, there is, uh, what, what they are trying to do is uh, create an amazing opportunities. Uh, through that opportunity, we will be able to provide a high quality education for the youth. We will allow them to kind of excel in this specific sector. So far, we had 16 graduates we, uh, in uh, two batches. Currently, we have 11 students enrolled in this program. Uh, we're trying to build a world-class national engineering talent pool uh, focused on this, uh, on this specific industry. They're gaining in-depth or a hands-on kind of experience and knowledge from designing, evaluating, assessing, and integrating such solutions and even launching them. Uh, we had various majors, I mean, uh, from uh, those students, uh, as it is mentioned, but it is worth mentioning that 92% of uh, those graduates were UAE Emiratis. So this is where we see uh, the interest of the youth uh, coming towards, towards the space industry. One of the other applications, or a little bit of uh, YASAT emiratizations, we, we managed to achieve 64% of emiratizations, which is two-thirds of whom have a technical uh, specialization. So if we try to break down this, this percentage with respect to the number of uh, employees that we have, uh, I mean, among uh, the 276, we have 170 Emiratis. Two-thirds of those are uh, t uh, they have a technical specialization background. 28% of them are fresh grad, so this is the continuing intake that we keep, uh, we keep getting. 36% of them are an experienced national in this industry. The last kind of application that we use in order to upskill uh, the national kind of uh, skill sets within this industry is the overseas assignments. Uh, through our agreements with our partners, uh, I mean, around the world uh, for various uh, services or even uh, the development of a specific satellites, we do send a specific national team to go there and follow up with the developments and gain experience out of those opportunities. 
And what you see in this map is a real kind of example of the teams that have been deployed in those areas. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Aisha. I see that many of us are talking about cute CubeSats, not cute. It is cute, it's very small, though. it's like the size of a tissue box. Uh, the great thing, I'm very happy to see that as well. Uh, congrats on your initiatives in terms of CubeSats. It's one of the best ways to educate the universities, the students, on what's uh, basically the process of developing satellite in a very smaller way. Because basically, in terms of milestones, you have to go through similar milestones, but uh, very lighter in terms of load and things like that. Uh, so we are happy to see that. Michelle, a quick question. Do you get to send CubeSats to space as well? Yeah, so the idea is even Khalifa Sat would be in the same category because as okay. I mentioned, it's all the way from one kilo, which is a, a weight of a CubeSat, True. all the way up to 500 kilos, which Khalifa Sat is like uh, between 200 and 300, right? Yes. Yeah, so technically it's still a small satellite okay. category. So do you only send satellites or you send humans as well? <laughs> not humans, not. No, no there are many people want to get yeah, rid of. Not yet. No, yeah. just you satellites. Want to get rid of some people? Yes. Oh, okay. There's many other rockets that uh, can take. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nice. So, a question for you, astronaut uh, Nicole. So, uh, when we announced the UAE na astronaut program, one third of the applicants from the 4,022 were actually female, which is a great number. Uh, so, we are very proud of that. But still, uh, remember going back to the workshops and things like that. Uh, females had lots of concerns, like. How would the training be with, with, for them? Like, is it, is it more challenging for females than males? We know in terms of biology, uh, if, if anything, female might have even more advantage. But in terms of, let's say, the actual work environment, since you have been there, so can you tell us more about that part? Uh, maybe a few words to motivate them, so maybe ne by next batch they apply more? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing I like to say to start off with that is that the rocket ship doesn't care if you're a boy or girl. Absolutely, the science doesn't care, the computer doesn't care. The, it's, we do this to ourselves when we, um, and I even growing up, I, I second guessed along the way, you know, should I even pick up the pen and fill out the application? And it was very late that I decided to do that. And it was really because somebody else encouraged me to wow. do it. I, I don't think I would have done it on my own. I loved all of the stuff that went into you know, what it would take to be an astronaut, the engineering, the science, the, I would argue, even the art and creativity side of it, I think is important. But there is absolutely nothing about the job that um, is restrictive in any way um, because you're a man or woman. Sure. And I'll tell you, I highly recommend it. And I hope that you will see more um, more female applicants in the future. I love seeing the numbers that you have across the industry already. 40% is, I would argue, I think that's probably the highest I've seen anywhere. Um, in our universities in the US for engineering, um, I, we went to Embry-Riddle to the same, True. we went to the same university and uh, we still are working very hard to get above the 25% you know, enrollment sure. for, for women in engineering. And I think um, I'm very, very thankful for what everyone is doing because I think we have to engage young girls very early. By the time they're 12, 13, we have to be uh, generating some excitement sure. for them. And so, because they are naturally talented when it comes to science and math, and then something discourages them and we need to stop that discouragement. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. Michelle, I have a question for you. So you always talk about rockets, you send people, satellites, you throw them up in the space. And I saw in, through your social media, you talk very closely about astronauts and thing, things like that. Did you ever think that, uh, why would you not be an astronaut? Did you ever think of applying? Of course, I have every intention to apply as an astronaut, 100%. Because I would like to go to space. I mean, that's every child's dream. And it True. was definitely my dream when I saw the stars. So did you apply yet or Not still? yet. I'm, I'm actually in the process of finishing my pi uh, pilot's license. Nice. So once I get that, I, I plan to apply. But don't okay. wait. If they have another class, don't wait until yeah, you have I, your I will apply topic. immediately as soon as I see like, okay, the recruitment. Okay, amazing. Best of luck. Okay, so I have a question more to that side of the panel for Amr and Isa. So we're, especially Amr, the programs that you showed us and Isa as well, you guys were covering everything from a Mars mission to astronaut, to building or developing satellites, to a 100-year plan to build a city on Mars. 
so if you go and tell anyone about this achievement, they probably won't believe you. They will think it's a media stunt, right? I will, I'm sure they will think of that. Can you tell us more? Like today, if we look at in the space industry, UAE is taking a big lead in this in, in space. In the region, UAE is taking a big lead. And we are a very young country. Uh, can you guys tell us more? How did it all start? Please. I think, uh, I mean, specifically for us, the Mohammed Brush Space Center back in 2006, uh, everybody knew the UAE and the achievements that have been, uh, I mean, uh, achieved in the UAE back at that time. But there was something missing, which is science and technology. We had great universities, we had great uh, researchers, but I mean, we had to capitalize something, capitalize this into something, and this is why we started the Mohammed Brush Space Center and the focus on space, specifically space was, you know, everybody knows space is very inspiring. If, even now when we see it, when we see our kids, when we see even uh, older generations, they are very much inspired. So space is inspiring. Second thing is space is very challenging. It's, uh, you know, getting involved in these technologies, getting involved with, I mean, sometimes talking about these technologies, you might be stopped by someone. And the third thing is space usually leads cutting edge research and technology. And uh, this is why we decided as a country, the UAE, to go into space and start uh, developing uh, something in the UAE. So now we have, uh, mashallah, so much involvement. Uh, as you said, Mars mission, uh, uh, you know, human space flight. Uh, air communication satellites, air reservation satellites, services all over the world. And uh, I think the key message or the key thing was behind this was very strategic goal. I think everybody should know many countries tries to be involved in space, tries to do something in space, but I would say one or two steps, uh, they stop. And usually because the, the initial target, the initial goal is a short-term goal. In the UAE, it's very obvious for us. Everybody knows we always have very long-term goals and very challenging goals. You, you know, our Prime Minister, Sheikh Mohammed Barashid, always says the number one. It's very hard to be number one in space when you have the US and Russia. They are in space for like more than 60 years. Very hard to compete with them. But uh, if you put very hard, challenging goals, you will know that uh, the achievements will be bigger and you will never stop. So, uh, you know, when we started, we, in, in the center, we started by saying we want to build Earth observation satellites. And now, because the, the, bar, the, the bar is high, uh, now we are going into a very long-term strategic goal of 100 years. And so I would always say it's very important to have a key strategic goal from the beginning and the rest will come. Uh, what we noticed, the UAE nationals, especially the youth, are th they are very risk takers, actually, and they really like this challenge, and they take it seriously. And uh, this is something we are all proud of. Okay. Thank you, Amr. Let me add, Amr, to, to your points. Uh, we'll address your questions in a different manner. Sure. Uh, let's look at uh, the UAE space sector. Uh, how old is it? around 12, 13 years. How many satellites we have as of today? We're talking about uh, YASA, the three satellites, two Thorayas, three MB MBRCs, and two CubeSats which already been launched. So we are talking about 10 satellites. And there are other missions as well which are gonna bring more satellites by uh, 2020. The way we see, I mean, looking at this age with this huge number of satellites that serves and provides various kind of applications, space-based applications. I mean, we're covering most of the applications, and some of those are into R&Ds and scientifics. The, I think this will keep continuing because even recently we noticed a huge kind of uh, active progressions towards the Mars probe mission, I mean, towards uh, 2020. So everyone trying to accelerate, everyone trying to uh, bring, I mean, a space-based kind of solutions or opportunities to be part of that evolutions that is happening now in UAE. And the way that I see it, yes, within a few years, 
UAE will become the, le uh, the regional uh, leader and the hub when it comes to uh, scientific uh, R&Ds in this uh, specific industry. Nice. Uh, thank you, Isa. Okay. So I have quick questions again. I will go back to this side. So you, you're a former astronaut, okay? You went uh, twice to space. You spent there more than, the, what, uh, more than 90 days in space, okay? So I'm sure there are lots of challenges. And then also, Michelle, with you as well. You have an aerospace uh, company, okay, you send rockets. I'm sure you have lots of challenges yourself in this case. Can you guys talk, please, about your challenges? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, astronaut uh, Nicole. Well, I think, first of all, even considering picking up the pen and filling out the application, I think the challenge for me there was always second-guessing whether anything I had done would be what they would want to select. And so I just took myself out of the running by not filling it out myself. Um, I always thought that people that get to be astronauts are these special people. And that is not true. I mean, I think, I think that, I mean, look at me. Maybe you're special? <laughs> you know, special. I, I, I don't feel that way. And, but I feel like I had, you know, studied the right things along the way. I was excited about those things. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like, you know, everything that I decided to do, whether it was to earn my private pilot's license or to study aeronautical engineering or to want to work with NASA on the space shuttle program, all of those were driven by the things I loved, the things I was passionate about and paid attention to. And then it took somebody encouraging me to pick up the pen and fill out the application. Um, I think that's the, the biggest challenge is second guessing ourselves in a lot of cases, especially for young girls, I would say. And then I just want to offer one comment that I love hearing across all of what's going on today. Even when you're talking about going to Mars and setting what I love to setting this challenge for yourself that's not this immediate gratification, this satisfaction that can come quickly, but looking at the longer term strategy um, from the very start not just thinking you can figure it out yourself, but taking advantage of the knowledge that's out there, of the resources that are available to you, and then jumping off of that and doing something better or the best. Um, I think that's really important. It's what the space station, to me, is all about. We've worked not just as the US, not just as Russia, but as this collection of countries, and I look forward to the UAE being part of that as well. And ultimately, it's all about improving life here on Earth whether we're going to Mars or back to the moon or, you know, mining asteroids. It's about improving life here on Earth. And when we figure out how to work as Earthlings, will be the settlements that we have on Mars will take us who knows where because we'll have, we'll have improved it here for, for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Can we, can we check on her microphone, please? Hello? Okay, now let's work. So I'll put it right here, so it makes my life easier. Um, in my case, so rockets are not easy, naturally. Like you hear the statement, oh, it's not rocket science, because rocket science is pretty complex, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, like a liquid type rocket or chemical rockets, they're hard to work with. For me, the technical challenges I always welcome. So any, any technical failures you have, any issues that you have in the design, in the manufacturing, and the concept is amazing because it's, if you fail, you learn how to fix it. Where I think one of the challenges that I do not like is the financial aspect because especially in private aerospace businesses, aerospace costs a lot of money and especially when you make rockets, it costs a lot of money. And if you're an investor, for example, you're like, well, it's like a, a seven to 10 year, so it's a long-term investment. And it's high risk because you, know, you have failures, you have this, and you, you have so many other risks that are involved. So if you're planning to put $100 million into a rocket company, you're not gonna see returns until after maybe 10, if you're, 10 years if you're lucky. So a lot of investors are very hesitant to put, company, to put money into these uh, aerospace companies. Currently, the climate is changing. So when, it, when I started my company in 2000, end of 2010, um, 10, beginning 2011, the market was not as it is today. So you see a lot more people trying to put money in aerospace than 
2010, 11, 12, 13, they were a little bit hesitant. A lot of the money that was out there was going towards companies like SpaceX and, and so forth. So when I started my company, we were the only company trying to create small satellite launch vehicles dedicated for small satellites. Today, there's like over 26 companies out there trying to do the same thing. So you see a shift in that um, financial aspect. So these are the different struggles. So I, I'm talking about the struggle in general in the aerospace field. Uh, from a personal perspective, for me, when I started the company, you know, obviously people thought I was nuts. They're like, oh, you're crazy. What do you think you're doing? And I'm like, yeah, it's true. I probably am crazy. But like you said, it takes risk to be able to achieve things in life. And this is what UAE is taking a risk trying to go uh, to Mars. It's the first time there'll be ever, uh, the, the first time for an Arab and a GCC country to launch something uh, like that. So it, it always starts with taking a risk. Even for investors, it, they need to take the risk to put the money to advance technology. Otherwise, it's, we never move forward. So one is the risk-taking aspect is very critical for the advancement of any sort of business. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult sometimes emotionally for a human being because you're like, oh, that second-guessing aspect, like, oh, maybe I'm not going to be able to do it. But I found out that the best way to deal with that is if you do not wake up every morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh, my God, I am crazy for doing this, then you're not challenging yourself enough. So you need to wake up every morning and be like, ah, I'm crazy because I'm trying to do this impossible thing that then you make possible. And then you open the door for the rest of the people to walk through it. Uh, so that's basically like the gist of it. And I will be talking in detail about these difficulties at my session at 3 p.m. Thank you. So indeed, it is very risky. Honestly, looking at all of it and seeing uh, all the missions have a big amount of risk. I remember even when I sit in meetings, they talk about different programs and they tell me the percentage of fail and things like that. I go like, no, we cannot announce this. It's like, no, we'll announce that the space is risky. So this is, I guess, uh, the industry that we are in. We have to always uh, take it. I think one of the critical things is the fear of failure. In today's world, you cannot be afraid to fail. You need to fail because I truly believe failure is the seed from which success grows. True. If you don't fail, you're not doing something right. Well said. Uh, I have a quick point. I want to just uh, hit on a bit about uh, knowledge sharing, uh, especially Amal with yourself and with yourself, Nicole. Uh, knowledge sharing is in the space industry is very important. Uh, I believe, Amal, you are one of the first teams that went to South Korea back in 2006. You spent there maybe around uh, 10 years. 10 years, yeah. And you speak Korean, right? Yeah, little. <laughs> little, right? <laughs> Just a quick story. I'm not supposed to say this. Uh, they had a big team from the Space Center going in 2006 to Korea for knowledge transfer program. So we're there for, they were there for many, many years, uh, maybe around 9, 10 years. So by the time they got back, it was not only knowledge transfer. It was even bigger than that. You know, Emirati people are very ambitious. Uh, some of them came back with kids and things like that. So <laughs> I think they did a very good job in uh, knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer. But Amr, I don't think you were one of these. Uh, you didn't do that. No, no, I just lost my hair there. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Amr, can you tell us what's the key? Okay, I know there are many programs. Okay, let's say you want to start a project. You go to a different entity. You tell them that you want to go to space jointly. And especially when space, space is a very sensitive topic to many countries because you have advanced technologies. You have advanced science, and trust me, don't think any entity will come and tell you, yeah, the thing that I've been working on for 30, 40 years, I'll give it to you. This won't happen. This is not the case. So can you give us just a, a tip? What are the key factors that we should, look, we should look into when looking for the right partner? Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, as you said, usually this is the bread and butter of companies or countries. It's very hard for them to just share it with you. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say luckily. I mean, the South Koreans have gone through the similar experience. They, they started in 19, I mean, late 1980s. And then by the time we actually approached them, they, they went through the full cycle. They were able to actually build their own satellites. Um, uh, it's very important, not only from the partner side, but also from our side to have a clear goal of what we want. Sometimes when you talk to uh, companies, they will tell you, yeah, if, if this is what you want, we'll give it to you. But if you, at, the some, I mean, at some point in the middle, you decide to shift your interest, sometime in the middle you decide to cut off your project and start something totally new, this makes you lose your own credibility. 
very important thing that we managed to do is to always continuously keep the same message, which is focusing on our own local capabilities, our people, and building their own capabilities. Uh, if you put this at the beginning, if you are very clear with your partner, I'm sure a lot of people around the world will appreciate that and will start cooperating with you. Something different also we did is, you know, when you, it, it's human nature. When you send people, it's very important to keep them motivated and keep them in the same uh, environment, in the same uh, challenge. Uh, when our engineers went there with the first program, they got the knowledge. But on the second program, they started challenging the partner with new technologies. So it's very important for you to add value to your partner also. That, OK, we'll build satellites, but we'll actually improve them together. So this is what we did in Dubai Sat2. So some of these, these technologies on Dubai Sat2 were actually, as I said, proposed and developed by our own engineers. This is what makes partnerships uh, a win-win situation. Uh, this is mainly about when I talk about uh, selecting the right partner. Uh, they have to be flexible, but you also have to be very, uh, I mean, appreciating that it has to be a win-win situation. But in general, what we did after finishing Dubai Sat2, starting Khalifa Sat, we should not forget that we started to become experts. I mean, some of our engineers have 10, 11 years of ex experience. We have to start now sharing our knowledge. And it's very important that these experts in the UAE to actually work with the, the new generation and share with them. And uh, this is what we continued with Khalifa Saad. And this is why, you know, we started with eight, 10 engineers. And now we have more than 170. Uh, I mean, that's employees. But the engineering side is, or the scientific side is around 120. The big growth was actually for knowledge transfer within the center. And this does not apply only for space. I think it applies to all sectors. Experienced people have to share their knowledge with new generations. Thank you, Amar. Uh, I just have an, another way of asking the same question about knowledge sharing. Uh, international, the International Space Station been in, spa been in space since 1998, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's still up today, until today, and it's orbiting. So whenever we see any astronauts being trained they, uh, and they are in space, that means they are actually in the International Space Station, which is the ISS, which is actually orbiting Earth. And our astronauts are being trained to be launched to space next year to the same place. But the International Space Station is not only owned by the US. It's not only owned by the, by the Russian. There's actually partners, right? Yep. Uh, you have Russia and the USA. They work very closely together, even though they might not be the best friends, let's say, here on the ground. But if you go and talk about space, I could tell you that based on the work and the thing that's been happening and the achievement, there's no barriers there. So what practice that's being done in the ISS that do you think more of that should happen on, here on Earth and how? Or can you tell us, please, how is it happening there in the space? Well, I think it was very deliberate, first of all. Um, and that doesn't mean that the, so there's five s space agencies involved that represent 16 different countries. Wow. Um, you know, the Europeans having, you know, the, this bigger Columbus. number of them. But um, I think there was a very deliber deliberate, and it's like you were talking about coming together with something to give and something to learn. and. All of these countries have done that. Um, the mission was, and the, the challenge was very large in that you're gonna have this peaceful, successful cooperation in space with six crew members living and working there with one commander. And it's not like the US guys are only in the US segment and the Russian folks are in the Russian. It is one crew with one commander that might be a Russian cosmonaut a Belgian, uh, Japanese, you know, Canadian, it's, it's one team. And I think that decision to go into it as one team is what really is key to it all. Because then even if each country has different political or technical um, priorities, the rules of engagement are established for them to work that out. And they've decided in advance that they will work it out. And you are absolutely correct. You have those six people in space that work peacefully, successfully together, but you have tens of thousands of people on the ground across those agencies and the companies that support them working peacefully, successfully together. And I'm so happy that, you know, my son is 16 years old. As long as he's been alive, we've had people continuously working and circling this planet for the benefit of all of us. And it is absolutely the best model for how we can 
It's just a matter of scale. It's saying ISS is a spaceship, Spaceship Earth is a spaceship, and we just figure out how to establish those rules of engagement, and we work as crew, not passengers, and that's the key. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Okay, I think we're running out of time, so I just want to mention one thing. Uh, you, you guys uh, have accomplished a lot, uh, I would say, in your career so far, and uh, you gave me a hard time, by the way. Uh, reading about yourself, I found that, that you are an astronaut, okay? You are an aquanaut. An aquanaut. I think yes. you have lived under the water for 18 days. I don't know why, but you did that. Yeah, it was okay. awesome. Yeah. Uh, as a part of training for yeah. astronaut program. <laughs> and you're a pilot, right? Uh, you do outreach and inspire people, and you're a big activist in terms of art. And I have seen many others. So, and you're an engineer as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Okay. So, and, and a uh, mom. I like the mom one, uh, and too. The mom, the mom is good. <laughs> I think I've focused a lot. I believe that there should be a balance, but yeah, there's all of these things. So since we have only one minute left, can we just sum it up 30 seconds per person? What's your message to myself, to us, to all of us? Uh, what should we do? I mean, you guys didn't only do one thing and stop. I could see even Mishal yourself. Uh, you have your own rocket company, which is scary, but let's put that on the side. You're flying. I saw that you're flying and some other activities as well, and Amar and Isa at the same time. Uh, so can you give, give us a quick message of uh, like an advice? I think I'd go back to the three lessons that I passed on earlier, that we're all Earthlings, um, we live on a planet, and that, that one border that matters. I would, I would ask you to leave to today as an Earthling, as a crew made of Spaceship Earth. Wow, thank you. Bring my mic again. Um, I think the most important one is uh, rockets are not scary. I don't know why they're you keep saying me. they're scary. Trust me, they scare me. I mean, <laughs> rockets are our are, are gateway to space, so we kind of need them. Uh, they're very important. I think t uh, the takeaway for me from uh, f to, to leave uh, you guys with is space is very important. A lot of technology has been developed in space is, is used today for humans, uh, for science, medicine, you name it. A lot of people think, oh, why are we spending so much money going to space? Space gives you an environment that, uh, in some research, gives you a short period to study something that is critical, like osteoporosis, like uh, developing uh, certain types of proteins for medicine uh, on Earth. Uh, the fact that uh, you can detect cancer was a technology that was developed for space. So you need to recognize that space is the future, and, and it is used here back on Earth for us humans to benefit from. So this is something very critical for all of you to leave with because soon enough, a lot of us are going to be visiting space very often. Thank you, Mishad. I would say uh, what we have learned from our experience, uh, you know, after the launch of Khalifa Saad uh, a month ago, we, we were all celebrating. But I, I want you all to know that this celebration came after maybe yeah 12 years. These kind of achievements do not come in one day. You have to be patient. And believe me, the joy is not the achievement. The joy is what you know yourself after that. You will really know that throughout this dedication and consistent working on the same thing, or let's say with strong dedication, you improve yourself. And uh, this is what we keep saying in MBRC. Now we have a culture of challenging ourselves. So it's important to always maintain uh, your goals very high to achieve, and then you will find yourself improving with time. I think this is very important that you know this. So from my side, uh, basically, I mean, uh, it's a simple recommendation even to, to myself, and I always try to remind myself of this, and this is to everyone. Everyone try to uh, target success, and uh, the way that I see it, success is very simple. You need the three elements. You need the right qualifications or the right ingredients, you need to be in the right place at the right time. Looking at the amount of investment that UAE as a government now putting in this space industry, this is the right place and this is the right time. And if we're going to speak about the qualifications, looking at all the initiatives that comes from MBRC and uh, YASAT and other kind of uh, players in this, uh, in this sector, the, the qualifications are there. So. Someone need to grab those opportunities and achieve those successes. True. Thank you, Isa. Uh, thank you, Amar. Thank you, Mishael. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, everyone, for attending.